Lycidas by John Milton, written in 1637, from the Cambridge History of English and American Literature. In Lycidas, the delight reaches an even higher pitch. For once there was no need to quarrel, even with such an apparent hyperbole as Mark Patterson calling it the high watermark of English poetry, especially as high watermark is not a thing that can only once be reached. The circumstances, form, and character of this exquisite poem have been the subject of a great deal of writing. It formed part of a collection of episodes on Edward King, a slightly younger contemporary of Milton, who had become a college mate and tutor and had intended to take orders, but was drowned on a voyage to Ireland in the summer of 1637. Milton's contribution is signed J.M. only. The general scheme is that of a classical pastoral elegy. The verse form is very peculiar. In fact, up to its date, unique arrangement of stanzas and lines of unequal length, for the most part irregularly and not entirely rhymed, but terminating in a regular octave. To what extent the poem expresses personal sorrow has been largely but very unnecessarily questioned. As an elegy, it has, poetically speaking, no superior, even in a language which contains the various laments on Sydney before, and Adonais and Thyrsus after. The whole poem is a tissue of splendid passages, not unconnected, but sewn cunningly together rather than woven in one piece as regards subject. There cannot be better verse than Lycidas. Lycidas by John Milton Yet once more, O ye laurels, and once more, ye myrtles brown, with ivy never sere, I come to pluck your berries harsh and crude, and with forced fingers rude, shatter your leaves before the mellowing year. Bitter constraint and sad occasion, dear, compels me to disturb your season due. For Lycidas is dead, dead ere his prime, young Lycidas, and hath not left his peer. Who would not sing for Lycidas? He knew himself to sing and build the lofty rhyme. He must not float upon his watery bear, unwept and welter to the parching wind, without the meed of some melodious tear. Begin then, sisters of the sacred well, that from beneath the seat of Jove doth spring, begin and somewhat loudly sweep the string. Hence with denial vain and coy excuse, so may some gentle muse with lucky words favour my destined urn, and as he passes turn, and bid fair peace be to my sable shroud. For we were nursed upon the self-same hill, fed the same flock by fountain, shade, and rill, Together both, ere the high lawns appeared under the opening eyelids of the morn, we drove afield and both together heard what time the grey fly winds her sultry horn, battening our flocks with the fresh dews of night, off till the star that rose, at evening bright towards heaven's descent, had sloped his westering wheel. Meanwhile the rural ditties were not mute, tempered to the oaten flute. Rough satyrs danced, and fawns with cloven heel, from the glad sound would not be absent long, and old Demetus loved to hear our song. But, oh, the heavy change, now thou art gone, now thou art gone and never must return. Thee shepherd, thee the woods and desert caves with wild thyme and the gadding vine o'ergrown, and all their echoes mourn. The willows and the hazel copses green shall now no more be seen fanning their joyous leaves to thy soft lays. As killing as the canker to the rose, or taint-worm to the weanling herds that graze, or frost to flowers that their gay wardrop wear when first the white thorn blows. Such, Lycidas, thy loss to shepherd's ear. Where were ye nymphs when the remorseless deep closed o'er the head of your loved Lycidas? for neither were ye playing on the steep, where your old bards, the famous druids, lie, nor on the shaggy top of Mona high, nor yet where Deva spreads her wizard stream. Ay, me, I fondly dream. Had ye been there, for what could that have done? What could the muse herself that Orpheus bore, the muse herself for her enchanting son, whom universal nature did lament, when by the rout that made the hideous roar his gory visage down the stream was sent, down the swift Hebrus to the lesbian shore. Alas, what boots it with uncessant care to tend the homely slighted shepherd's trade, and strictly meditate the thankless muse, were it not better done as others use, 
to sport with Amaryllis in the shade, or with the tangles of Nera's hair. Fame is the spur that the clear spirit doth raise, that last infirmity of noble mind, to scorn delights and live laborious days. But the fair guerdon when we hope to find, and think to burst out into sudden blaze, comes the blind fury with the abhorred shears, and slits the thin-spun life, but not the praise. Phoebus replied and touched my trembling ears. Fame is no plant that grows on mortal soil, nor in the glistering foil set off to the world, nor in broad rumour lies, but lives and spreads aloft by those pure eyes and perfect witness of all judging Jove. As he pronounces lastly on each deed of so much fame in heaven, expect thy meed. O fountain, Arethuse, and thou honoured flood, smooth sliding Mincius crowned with vocal reeds, that strain I heard was of a higher mood, but now my oat proceeds, and listens to the herald of the sea that came in Neptune's plea. He asked the waves and asked the felon winds what hard mishap hath doomed this gentle swain, and questioned every gust of rugged winds that blows from off each beaked promontory. They knew not of his story, and sage Hippotatus their answer brings, and not a blast was from his dungeon strayed. The air was calm and on the level brine. Sleek Panope with all her sisters played. It was that fatal and perfidious bark, built in the eclipse and rigged with curses dark, that sunk so low that sacred head of thine. Next Camus, reverend sire, went footing slow, his mantle hairy and his bonnet sedge, inwrought with figures dim and on the edge, like to that sanguine flower inscribed with woe. Ah, who hath reft, quoth he, my dearest pledge? Last came and last did go, the pilot of the Galilean lake. Two massy keys he bore of metals twain, the golden opes, the iron shuts amain. He shook his mitred locks and stern bespake, How well could I have spared for thee, young swain, and now of such as for their bellies' sake. Creep and intrude and climb into the fold. Of other care they like reckoning make, Than how to scramble at the shearer's feast, And shove away the worthy bidden guest. Blind mouths that scarce themselves know how to hold a sheep-hook, Or have learned aught else the least, That to the faithful herdman's art belongs. What wrecks it them? What need they? They are sped, and when they list, their lean and flashy songs grate on their scrannel pipes of wretched straw. The hungry sheep look up and are not fed, but swollen with wind and the rank mist they draw, rot inwardly in foul contagion spread. Besides what the grim wolf with privy paw daily devours apace and nothing said, but that two-handed engine at the door stands ready to smite once and smite no more. Return, Alpheus, the dread voice is past, that shrunk thy streams. Return, Sicilian muse, and call the veils, and bid them hither cast their bells and flowerts of a thousand hues. Ye valleys low where the mild whispers use, of shades and wanton winds and gushing brooks, on whose fresh lap the swart star sparely looks, throw hither all your quaint enameled eyes, that on the green turf suck the honeyed showers and purple all the ground with vernal flowers. Bring the wraith primrose that forsaken dies, the tufted croto in pale jessamine, the white pink in the pansy freaked with jeet, the glowing violet, the musk rose and the well-attired woodbine, with cowslips wan that hang the pensive head, and every flower that sad embroidery wears. Bid Amaranthus all his beauty shed, and daffodillies fill their cups with tears, to strew the laureate hearse where Lycid lies. For so to interpose a little ease, let our frail thoughts dally with false surmise. Ay, me, whilst thee the shores and sounding seas wash far away, where e'er thy bones are hurled, whether beyond the stormy Hebrides, where thou perhaps under the whelming tide visitest the bottom of the monstrous world or whether thou to our moist vows denied, sleepest by the fable of Belarus old, 
where the great vision of the guarded mount looks toward Namankos and Bayona's hold. Look homeward, angel, now, and melt with Ruth, and, O oh, ye dolphins, waft the hapless youth. Weep no more, woeful shepherds, weep no more. Felicitous your sorrow is not dead. Sunk though he be beneath the watery floor, so sinks the day-star in the ocean bed, and yet anon repairs his drooping head, and tricks his beams, and with new spangled oar, flames in the forehead of the morning sky. So Lycidas sunk low but mounted high, through the dear might of him that walked the waves, where other groves and other streams along, with nectar pure his oozy locks he laves, and hears the unexpressive nuptial song, in the blessed kingdoms meek of joy and love. There entertain him all the saints above, in solemn troops and sweet societies, that sing and singing in their glory move, and wipe the tears for ever from his eyes. Now Lycidas the shepherds weep no more, henceforth thou art the genius of the shore, in thy large recompense, and shalt be good to all that wander in that perilous flood. Thus sang the uncouth swain to the oaks and rills, while the still morn went out with sandals grey. He touched the tender stops of various quills, with eager thought warbling his Doric lay. And now the sun had stretched out all the hills, and now was dropped into the western bay. At last he rose and twitched his mantle blue, to-morrow to fresh woods and pastures new.'